Thank you very much for having me here today. I'm going to talk about Australia's energy transition, decarbonising Australia's energy, and the tipping point where we are currently at. This first slide was put together by Professor Leslie Hughes, who's one of the councillors for the Climate Council. She put this together in 2012, and I think it's a fascinating way of looking at the problem, where she is juxtaposed, on top of the scientific, uh, the estimate of global warming, she is juxtaposed her lifetime, her children and her grandchildren. I think this is a really great way to bring the science back to the personal level. As you can see, in our lifetimes, we may well see significant warming towards the end of it, but it's our kids and our grandchildren who will be saddled with the decisions that we make today. Fortunately, since 2012, when this was put together, we've had the Paris Climate Agreement and we've had a change in significant changes in policy, which mean it's unlikely that we're going to see the top of these red bands. We're towards the lower end of these red bands now, but we're a long way from the blue. So how are we going in Australia? Well, our energy transition is accelerating. Uh, on this chart, you can see the black line is coal, the turquoise line is renewables with gas being orange. Now, you can see coal peaked in around 2008 when the ratio of coal to renewables was about 16 to one. We're now at the point where it's two to one. Experts believe that the crossover will happen sometime around 2025, 26. So we are accelerating our energy transition. We've done this mainly through wind and solar. One of the projects uh, that came out of the Energy Transition Hub, um, which I'm a member of at Melbourne University, one of those projects is called OpenNEM, uh, which allows uh, anybody um, uh, to, to to log into a system for free and uh, and have a look at how our energy system is evolving right you know, down to the five minute scale zooming all the way out uh, to the um, 22 years now since the national electricity market was was formed um, to have a look at how uh, um, how the mix of energy has been changing uh, how it changes in different ways in different states um, We've, uh, we're, we're in the process now of adding an emissions overlay to that, so you can see how emissions and emissions intensity are changing. And we've recently, um, I, I guess, rebuilt the core of the system so we can pull in data from other countries. So expect that over the coming year or so, uh, we're open and will allow you to look at the energy transition happening uh, in, in other countries of interest. If you look at this chart, this is the change since peak coal in 2008. Coal is significantly down, solar being yellow, and wind being green are significantly up. Slight change in hydro, which changes year to year with seasonal variation, and gas slightly down. So you can see that wind and solar have displaced a very significant amount of coal in our electricity system. Back in 2004, uh, we built a house on a small farm, hobby farm in Dalesford, and we were a long way from power lines. So uh, it made sense even back then to to build a a, a passive house uh, using uh, us, using solar power um, with batteries and a diesel backup. Uh, after a few years, they're getting getting familiar with living off grid. Um, we we realised that we were um, our, our batteries would be totally full by 10 a.m. on uh, in summer much of the year, but in winter we could have day, dirty days, uh, days in a row where we didn't have much solar power. Uh, and, um, uh, and I started thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could use the wind in, uh, in, in winter to help us carry through and not have to burn diesel? So I did a lot of, lot of looking into small wind and I generally found that it didn't make a lot of economic sense. But in my research, I bumped into, uh, on the main street of Dalesford, a Danish national who had this vision. He thought, we live in a really windy area in Dalesford, but we get most of our power from Latrobe Valley, some 300 kilometres away. Why don't we, uh, as a community, come together, as many do in Denmark, uh, and put up our own wind turbines to power the town? And he was infectious with his enthusiasm. Uh, I was probably about the 300th person to sign up to his crazy plan. Um, I went along to the, um, I think when he had 500 people, he held a formation meeting for, the, for a cooperative to deliver this project. I went along to that meeting and accidentally came out as the chair of the organisation. We set about fundraising to build um, just two turbines would generate as much power as the town used. Um, and we set about, um, we thought we could raise the amount of money in about 12 weeks. The financial crisis hit, so it took about 24 months, but we, we did it. We raised about $10 million uh, and built two turbines uh, that sit on top of Leonard's Hill 
this uh, this month uh, will be the tenth anniversary of them generating um, about as much power as two thousand homes use. Uh, and it's cooperatively owned, Australia's first community-owned power station. So more than half of uh, the shareholders or members in the cooperative are, um, are locals to, to the Hepburn Shire. So it was a fascinating process at Hepburn in that it was, uh, it was in a, it's actually in a really awkward uh, scale in that it's, it's three orders of magnitude bigger than a household uh, solar system would be. Um, but it's maybe two orders of magnitude smaller than a utility scale project would be. So it sits in this awkward territory in, in the middle. Uh, but a great thing about it is that we were no threat to, uh, to the big end of town. And we got a large amount of, uh, of advice, pro bono ad advice from industry who taught us the ropes. So, uh, building a small project is, is no simpler. Than building a um, you know, building a two turbine wind farm is really no simpler than a hundred turbine wind farm, um, but those of us who were lucky enough to be at the centre of the project got um, got to get across how um, you know I guess the, the, the engineering, uh, uh, the construction, the energy market, the community engagement, financial, uh, every po the, the politics and media around. Uh, around renewable energy, and it was a really interesting time. It was a time when um, uh, there were concerns about um, wind turbine syndrome, that wind turbines would give people cancer or, or other ailments. Um, so we learned a lot about, uh, I guess, the, the social, economic, technical aspects of, uh, of, of renewable energy. It was a fantastic introduction uh, to the area and really kicked, sparked off um, an interest in, in me um, yeah, to analyse uh, th this, this space. Um, you know, it's a, I, I'm absolutely um, obsessed with analysing the energy uh, space in Australia and the energy transition globally. Now, it's been four years this month since Alan Finkel, who is chief scientist, laid down his independent review, nicknamed the Finkel Review. One of the outcomes of that review was a direction to AEMO, the Australian energy market operator, to put together an integrated system plan every two years. So 2018 and then 2020 were the first two integrated system plans. And this, for the very first time, painted a long-term picture of uh, where our energy system, where our electricity system uh, would go, using a number of scenarios, the most aggressive of which was the step change scenario. So that is assuming there's commitment to reduce emissions and a large amount of wind and solar to do so. Under the Finkel review, the four different scenarios showed that coal would leave our system at a fairly rapid pace. Just so three years later, the integrated system plan was updated to show a much more aggressive view. And when that report is updated again next year, we'll see that coal line even steeper still. So coal capacity is falling and is falling fast and faster than ever anticipated. Here's a uh, representation of the integrated system plans step change scenario. To the left, we have the progress over the last 12 years. And to the right, we have the step change scenario. Under the step change scenario, as I showed before, coal comes out, that's the black line. We have hydro chugging along the blue line. Wind and solar are the champions here, taking up the majority of the generation task. And then a thin line of orange being gas. So gas stays around, but playing a, uh, a smaller, but still significant role in balancing the grid. Now, with all this wind and solar coming to the system, people ask, how are we going to keep the lights on when, in the classic cliche, when the wind don't blow and the sun don't shine? Well, it turns out we still have a big role for dispatchable generation. Dispatchable generation being the generation that you can turn on and off at will. As you can see on the left-hand side, in the early years, we have a lot of coal and gas, the black, brown and grey. And gradually, over the decade, that's replaced by those other colours under the dotted red line with storage. The dotted red line are the, are the dispatchable generation. So you can see that as we go forward, we have an increase in the variable renewables above the line, but we have a constant or near constant amount of dispatchable generation helping us keep the lights on. What we're doing though is replacing this dispatchable uh, fossil generation with dispatchable storage and clean generation. One way to look at this is thinking about our electricity as being either fresh or frozen. Fresh energy, just, just like it, food in our refrigerator, fresh is used as it is produced. So when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, feeding directly into the grid and powering our consumption. Obviously, uh, in the times when it's not, we need to pull from storage. So think of that as frozen electricity, electricity we put either in pumped hydro uh, or in, uh, in batteries. 
What you can see in this chart is actually the vast majority of our energy as we transition, the grey being fossil, the green being renewable, the purple being from storage or coming from the freezer, the vast majority of our energy is going to come fresh. It's only a small amount that comes from storage. And as you can see, the middle section is the 2020s, the right section is the 20, 2030s. We only need a little bit of storage in this decade. About a third of that is from Snowy Hydro. The rest of it is expected to come from batteries and maybe a little bit of pump storage. Pumped hydro is a great technology and it's, and it's, it, it's by no means new. We have, we have um, at least three, we have three um, pumped hydro projects in Australia that were built in the 70s um, and they play a significant role uh, in, in our grid. Um, the the modelling that I showed from uh, from the energy market operator shows by the end of this decade we only um, well they only count for having one what they call deep storage um, facility so that's something that has more than two days worth of of storage. Snowy Hydro is is um is a week's worth of energy uh, in it if they were to run it flat flat out. Pumped hydro it, it it's it's a fantastic uh, resource for balancing the grid, um, but pumped hydro projects are hard to build. You've You've got to find. You know, you've got to have the magic uh, confluence, I guess, of the terrain, um, access to the grid, um, the uh, you know, in a, in areas that are um, not environmentally sensitive. I mean, the very first big one we've built this century, uh, Snowy Hydro, is an incredibly environmentally sensitive uh, area and um, uh, certainly contentious on on on, on that front. One of the big differences, I guess, between um, or, or, or the big influences on our energy system in the last 15 years or so has been the shift from constructed projects to manufactured technologies. So if you think um, every um, hydro dam's um, amazing energy source, but every hydro dam is is bespoke. Every one of them requires, uh, you know, starting with a clean sheet of paper uh, with the civil engineers, and um, uh, and every one of them has different characteristics. Whereas you can design a, um, if, if you like in Australia, if you want solar panels on your roof, you can call the number uh, one eight hundred number and get a quote where they're just looking at a satellite image of your house they can quote the project and the very first time someone comes to visit it is when they've got the solar panels on the truck similarly for large-scale solar farms um, most of the solar farms are just a carbon copy of the uh, of the of the of the last one so these are these projects have come down the cost curve because they're repeatable and they're built from modules that are repeatable um, pumped hydro projects every one of them's bespoke um, whereas batteries are just modules that Come off the back of a truck and be and are dumped in a field. There, um, uh, yeah, that that sort of repeatability um, uh, is how those technologies have come down the cost curve. Whereas projects that don't have repeatability really struggle with um, time to market and uh, and and the costs from not having those uh, economies of scale manufacturing. So how are we going? Well, we're moving faster than Finkel ever expected. This is the chart from his report on rooftop solar. And the red line I've superimposed on the top is how solar has been tracking in the four years since. Solar on rooftops is a standout in Australia. We have the highest adoption of rooftop solar per capita anywhere on the planet. Australia is extremely lucky to have an amazing renewable energy source. We, we have this expression that we're the lucky country, right? We, we, were, lucky with, we were lucky with gold. Um, we were lucky with our ability to grow wool. We uh, were lucky with our ability you know, to, to grow wheat with our coal, iron ore, um, gas resources. Uh, Australia has constantly uh, been um, you know, uh, uh, surprisingly lucky with its resources. And it turns out that we are extremely lucky with our wind and solar resources. A lot really is owed to the renewable energy target, which was put in place um, by the Howard government in 2001, uh, extended uh, by the Rudd government in 20, uh, 2010, I believe. Um, uh, which set a, uh, a, a target, um, a 20% by 2020 renewable target. We ended up actually at 27% by the end of last year. But that provided a mechanism in which the, uh, in which the sector could uh, finance projects and um, rapidly come down the cost curve. So our timing was good in Australia. Um, some countries, um, Germany, Canada, went um, harder earlier with renewables and they cost them a lot more. Um, we benefited from them. Um, they, they, they were the first movers. They helped bring renewables down. We grabbed um, those opportunities with our excellent resources. 
if you put solar panels on the wrong side of an Australian house, which you'd be crazy to do, to put them on the south side, they do better than the best panels in Germany. Right? Um, uh, but uh, Australia only overtook uh, the UK in 2019 with solar power. Um, but we have uh, continued to go, you know, to, to, to continue on with, with a vengeance. Um, we, we are installing uh, you know, rooftop solar faster than any, any country in the world. It just makes economic sense uh, in Australia. People aren't doing it because they want to save the environment. They're doing it because it just makes economic sense. So how are we going against the AEMO's even more aggressive step change scenario? Well, this from the Clean Energy Regulator just last month shows all the scenarios that have been put forward over the last three or four years and shows with the dotted black line that we are ahead of all of those scenarios. Australia is really moving fast with this transition in the electricity sector. Just as an aside, there's always a lot of concern about jobs. Uh, what's going to happen, especially when there are just not many jobs on a solar farm? Well, this analysis by the Institute for Sustainable Futures from the University of Technology, Sydney, shows that actually we're in a much better position than many would think. The dark purple bars down the bottom are ongoing jobs in renewables. The uh, lighter purple bars are the construction jobs. And that red line that I've superimposed over the top are jobs in coal power. Currently, the number of jobs in coal power in Australia is about 10,000. From 2023, when the Liddell power station is decommissioned, becoming the 14th to be commissioned in the last decade, we'll start seeing that number go down. But around about that time, the ongoing permanent jobs in renewable surpass that coal decline. And as you can see, as we move through the energy transition, not only are there a lot of construction jobs that go on for many, many years from now, but an increasing number of permanent jobs. And the great thing about those permanent jobs is that they're in the regions. Um, more than two thirds of these jobs uh, in renewables will be in the regions opening up uh, economic development in large parts of Australia that have previously not had the income diversity that renewable energy provides. So how are we doing with, uh, with so much happening in our energy transition? Well, compared to other countries and other regions, not very well at all. Looking at this chart recently put together by the Australia Institute, which is looking at the, I guess, the man-made emissions sectors. So we're excluding emissions from land and excluding emissions from agricultural practices. Just looking at the energy sector, Australia has actually increased our emissions since 2005, whereas countries like the United States, the United Kingdom and the European Union have managed to sustain reduced emissions. How have we done this when our electricity emissions have fallen so, so sharply? It's because they're being overwhelmed by changes in other sectors. So looking at this chart here, we see that stationary energy, which is the energy we use to heat our homes and businesses and water and, and some processes, those emissions have been increasing. Our transport emissions have been increasing and a category called fugitive emissions, uh, which are the emissions from when we extract gas and process gas and when we extract coal the methane and carbon emissions that are released from our fossil fuel extraction. Adding those up with a small amount of increase from industrial processes, and you can see that our reduction in the electricity sector is being totally overwhelmed by the increases in those other sectors. So it's not just electricity where we need to reduce emissions. It's across the whole economy. So electricity is the largest of our sectors. About 33% of emissions in Australia come from that sector and it is falling. But now we have to look at the other sectors, the direct combustion or stationary energy, transport and the fugitives are the largest sectors that need most of our focus right now. We do have solutions in agriculture and waste, but the technologies we have most at hand uh, are in those sectors that I've marked here in red. It's a simple plan really from here, electrify everything and move to 100% renewables. While electricity emissions have been falling, and, and, and impressively so, they've been completely wiped out by increases uh, in other sectors. Um, transport and fugitive emissions are, um, are, are the standouts. Um, transport, we, we, Australia has the weakest uh, emission standards of uh, almost every country uh, in the world, certainly of every developed country in the world. Our, our vehicle emission standards um, are well behind uh, yeah, uh, every G20 country, um, well behind China. Um, we, we, we have a really poor track record on, um, on emissions controls in vehicles. And as, uh, as, as the general um, population in Australia has, has grown and people have moved to larger cars, and cars with the world's weakest emission standards, uh, we've seen our transport emissions uh, on the rise. Um, it's unfortunate that we, we 
haven't taken any leadership in in this position, but gradually will be forced to do so as as there be fewer and fewer, uh, I guess, uh, vehicles with dirty engines on the market. But we still we'll, we'll have the tail end of that market until we address uh, until we address that point. With fugitive emissions, a very large amount of it comes from uh, from the gas sector. So. That's um, uh, leakage in the, uh, I guess, from 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 the wellhead, um, uh, fr uh, all the way you know, the collection um, reticulation system, all the way to the processing facility. There's leaks along the way, and then in the processing of the gas, uh, ready ready for export, the carbon dioxide in the gas has to be stripped out, and uh, in almost every case is vented directly into the atmosphere. Um, so between leaks and the CO2 from processing. Um, uh, our shift to being to becoming the world's largest exporter of LNG has seen a uh, commensurate, very large increase in the amount of uh, emissions from um, uh, from from the gas processing sector. Now, there's a quote from Bill McKibben who says that there are no silver bullets with addressing climate change or emissions reductions. There's only silver buckshot. We really have to work across all the sectors of the economy and all the activities within those sectors. There are many such plans to do so, one of which, which I'm going to highlight today, is ClimateWorks uh, Decarbonisation Futures Plan, which builds on some 2015 work, updated in 2020, and provides a very detailed look across all economic sectors. They've built plans for uh, the transport, industry, buildings, electricity and agriculture sector. In each of these sectors, we see a reduction in emissions, and in the electricity sector, that reduction in emissions comes from reducing coal and replacing with renewables, as I showed before in those slides from the energy market operator. Just to give an example, in transport, again, there's no silver bullet. It's a combination of many different activities. So mode shifting, moving some aviation to rail and lighter vehicles, for example, increased use of video conferencing, all the way down to using biofuels, renewable hydrogen and renewable ammonia as fuels. So choosing to focus on many different activities within the sector and then working on each sector. And you can see here, this is how they envisage that transport emissions, the trajectory they could follow from here to very low emissions in 2050, which would be essential for us to hit net zero by 2050. Here's a summary of all those sectors put together and three different scenarios when they call two degrees deploy, two degrees innovate, and 1.5 degree all in. I'll let you read the report to read on the details, but you can see these have a significantly reduced emissions in 2030, much reduced in 2050, not zero, relying on carbon forestry, so planting significant amounts uh, or revegetating significant parts of the country in order to give us zero or, in this case, negative emissions. A key development in order to reduce our emissions will be uh, what, is, what is known as sector coupling. So integrating our energy system, that framework of electrify everything, integrating our system so that as we are generating large amounts of renewable energy, some of it's feeding into the grid and directly feeding processes, some of it's feeding into hydrogen electrolyzers and feeding hydrogen grid, which may go into other industries or transport or even in the export field. There are two ways to create hydrogen or two yeah, let's say two broad categories. One, one is through the electrolysis uh, of, of water, and we can use uh, green energy for that to make green hydrogen. Another way is to use fossil fuels. So whether that's uh, coal, which we call um, uh, black hydrogen, uh, or, or brown if it's brown coal, brown hydrogen, um, grey or even blue. Um, blue hydrogen is when we use uh, gas and we try to capture the majority of the emissions. Now, um, in all of those other methods, the, the um, there are still some fugitive emissions. So we're not going to get to zero emissions to hydrogen uh, if we start with fossil fuels. But I, I think yeah, there's a lot of concern that maybe um, some of this shift to hydrogen um, will, will end up stimulating demand for fossil fuels. I'm a lot less concerned uh, in that uh, lots of analysis I've seen shows that by the end of this decade, uh, electrolysis of water will be the cheapest way. And any large fossil project that's going to try to make hydrogen is going to take several years uh, to, to get the project up, and it'll be several years before there's significant demand on the hydrogen. So really, by um, if, 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 a, if someone was to go hard on building a, uh, a, a black, brown, grey or blue hydrogen plant, it may only have five years of economic viability before it's undercut by hydrogen. 
Uh, and I just don't think that people will find them uh, investable. Now, there might be one or two. Um, uh, I believe Santos has got a particularly good site in the middle of uh, at, at Moomba where the um, carbon capture and storage is particularly uh, uh, available or you know, there's just the right confluence of, of things coming together. But I don't think we'll see any widespread um, production or, or um, uh, increase, rather, of, of uh, fossil-derived hydrogen. The vast majority of hy you know, 99% of hydrogen that's produced in the world um, currently is produced from fossils, but it's the expansion that we're talking about. One of the key strategies for balancing the grid in a heavy renewable future is using large modulating heavy loads. So these are loads that can back off when there is uh, a deficit of energy and they can ramp up when there is a uh, abundant supply of, of cheap energy. So one example is hydrogen electrolyzers, which will be dialed up to use energy when it's plentiful or desalination plants that can turn on and off desalination trains in order to help balance the network. And even this technology that I had the privilege of visiting in 2019 in Europe, this technology developed in Bacchus Marsh in Victoria, a cement process that not only allows you to capture all the CO2, but in its current iteration or it's the iteration that's being developed right now, can modulate electrical load. So it can use electrical load and turn up and down uh, in, in order to play well in a heavily renewable dominated electricity supply. My own group at, uh, at Melbourne University, the Climate and Energy College, has been a, a, a lead player in the Energy Transition Hub, an Australian-German program. One of the reports that we're most proud of is work that found with a 400% renewable grid in Australia, so that means powering ourselves and three times as much energy being exported overseas, we find, as you can see on this chart, that as we move from 100% renewables to 400, the system costs of integrating that much renewables and storage fall um, such that our energy cost in the country will be lower. So as Australia becomes a clean energy superpower, um, the cost of energy in Australia falls. Well, the Climate and Energy College um, predates my involvement at Melbourne University, but it's a, uh, it's a multidisciplinary space that uh, allows, I guess, both the physical co-mingling of students across uh, disciplines involved in climate and energy at, at Melbourne University, but it also is a, uh, well, it's, it, it's a um, concentration of PhD candidates across, uh, a, a, across the field. It runs a lot of, um, uh, a lot of seminars um, and, and provides um, a space, uh, I guess, um, where uh, the PhD candidates can benefit from, I guess, sort of the, uh, the discussions and, and everyday informal gatherings that come when you've got students of different disciplines together. It's, it's, a, it's an incredible space, obviously hit hard by COVID. Um, almost nobody uh, was in, in, the, um, in, in the space in 2020, but slowly coming back to life uh, as, as we move into 2021. So the um, Climate Energy College and uh, uh, the Crawford School at ANU um, um, put together a proposal with, um, I think, four German institutions uh, who um, are also focused on energy transition. The, and the project was the, um, the Australian German Energy Transition Hub. Uh, project was put together by, um, what was funded by uh, the Turnbull government and uh, Merkel government made an agreement to fund that. Unfortunately, uh, it was defunded last year. So some of the activities are still going on, uh, uh, continuing on on a, on a shoestring or on residual funding. Uh, and hopefully the, um, the hub uh, is able to uh, secure new funding. Um, but with, there's still deep interactions between uh, the Climate Energy College and each of those partner universities uh, around the world. We've got so much to learn uh, from, our, from our German uh, peers. They, um, they haven't been stuck in the political... Um, quagmire that Australia has. Um, so uh, it's, it, it's fascinating just how much more advanced um, the, the thinking is on energy transition, you know, the thinking about uh, sector coupling, how, um, how you reduce emissions in, in sectors outside of electricity um, through having those working together. You know, they, because they haven't been spending the last 10 years discussing whether they should transition, but how they should transition, um, there's so much we can learn uh, from them and so much we have in the in the last few years. Fortunately, I think that's I mean that's really changed in the last few years and it was in, in Australia that three or four years ago we were still discussing whether or not we should transition. but we um, Australia, for example, we, we have built as much renewables in the last three years as we did in the 30 years prior to that. 
um, the transition is, um, it's not a question of if it's going to happen or when it's going to happen. It's at this point, it's um, how fast it's happening and how fast it's accelerating. I want to give a couple of examples of clean energy superpower projects. This one is the Asian Renewable Energy Hub up in the Pilbara in Western Australia. If built as envisaged, it will be the largest energy facility in the world, larger than Three Gorges Dam in China. A very significant array of wind turbines interspersed with solar panels. And in this site, not only is there fantastic uh, wind and solar resource, but they are, uh, they are negatively correlated. So in this area, we have less wind during the day and high winds at night, perfectly complementing, or very well complementing, the large uh, amount of solar during the day. The Asian Renewable Energy Pro Project will use its vast uh, amount of renewable energy to desalinate water and create hydrogen through hydrogen electrolysis. We'll also use air separation units to pull out nitrogen to be combined with the hydrogen to make ammonia to be shipped offshore through these floating refueling buoys on hydrogen carriers to market. And the Japanese shipping companies are already building ships that will have the engines that can run on ammonia and ship the ammonia for their significant hydrogen or green ammonia plans. I was very lucky in early 2020 to, uh, to attend the Green Ammonia Consortium meeting in, in Tokyo. Um, which brought together uh, companies, researchers, uh, governments uh, focusing on the, uh, the green ammonia trade into Japan uh, and within uh, the industries within Japan that would use green ammonia. And, um, and a lot of the uh, interest in supply uh, was coming from Australia as well. We are very well positioned to, uh, to be a provider of green ammonia to Japan. Now, what are they, what are they wanted for? They, um, so it turns out yeah, hydrogen is very expensive to move from, from A to B. Um, in uh, compressed form, uh, it's not really practical. In liquid form, uh, is um, uh, so close to absolute zero, uh, you know, it, it makes uh, LNG look, uh, look easy. Ammonia turns out to be a practical method for moving hydrogen around. So um, also, ammonia, there's a very large amount of ammonia used in the world currently um, for fertilizer produ production. Um, it's thought that we could probably only support uh, half the number of people from our current agricultural systems if we didn't have ammonia-based fertilizers. So ammonia is a very important um, feedstock uh, into our you know, modern, modern society. Um, uh, and it's currently mostly made from gas, but it has other, other uses. Um, not only can we use it for, um, uh, uh, not only is it, a, is it a way of moving hydrogen from A to B, um, uh, but it can be itself used as a fuel. Um, so with, with um, not very significant modifications to diesel engines, they can burn, uh, they, they can burn ammonia. Uh, it can be mixed with other fuels and used in um, gas turbine engines. And in Japan, one of the first trials is actually to co-fire it with coal. So in the right uh, conditions, um, it can be squirted in with, with the coal uh, into coal power stations um, to reduce the, um, the, the emissions intensity of those coal, coal power stations. Japan's taking a bit of an all of the above strategy um, of um, creating demand. They, they, um, right now, green ammonia is not cheap. They, they see that if they can create demand, it will bring it down the cost curve, just as we've bought solar panel, brought solar panels and wind turbines and, and uh, other technologies. We need to bring the electrolyzers and the whole supply chain down the cost curve. Um, so they're looking, uh, they've, they've created a whole bunch of projects that will use green ammonia, um, uh, that will create demand for green ammonia um, in order to get um, clean fuels into their country um, in, in the coming decades. Another high, um, clean energy superpower story is the Sun Cable project. The big names of Mike Cannon Brooks and Twiggy Forrest behind it. The Sun Cable project aims to build the largest solar farm in the world, the largest battery farm in the world, ship that energy through high voltage cables up to Darwin, and then through subsea, high voltage DC, all the way to Singapore, 3,700 kilometers of subsea cable, powering about 20% of Singapore's uh, power. Very ambitious project, but uh, aims to be uh, sending power in, into clean energy into Singapore by the end of this decade. The Sun Cable project uh, is, is yeah, really, really quite an amazing project. It'll be the largest um, solar farm in the world if, it, if, it, you know, if it's built today. It, you know, who knows whether that's still going to be the largest by the end of this decade. Um, but yeah, massive project near Tennant Creek. Uh, send the power up to Darwin. It, um, they they um, 
are you know, they, they, they believe that by delivering a large amount of uh, low cost clean energy to Darwin that that will invigorate um, the local manufacturing so it will create local manufacturing opportunities in Darwin but the vast majority of the power will go on subsea cable um, very very interesting project from a technical engineering perspective it's a you know, it's, it's a very challenging um, uh, I guess um, yeah, uh, the, um, ocean channel it has to go through to get up to Singapore, but it'll, it'll provide about 20% of Singapore's power uh, cheaper than um, uh, yeah, cheaper than their alternatives, which in Singapore is largely gas. So I want to finish with this quote that Bill McKibben gave us, another quote from Bill McKibben. He says that winning slowly is the same as losing. Now, I will say that we are currently winning slowly, but we're accelerating. And the really good news is that we're accelerating quickly. So we are making great progress in one sector, the electricity sector, but it is being overwhelmed by our lack of progress. In fact, our, um, uh, our backsliding in, in other sectors. Australia is currently failing on emissions reductions. We aren't going to meet our, uh, we're not on a, we are not on a trajectory to meet our Paris commitments in 2030. And even then, those commitments were very weak. We took the US's, uh, yeah, we, we, we took the US's commitment and gave ourselves an extra five years. They've, con they've since increased their, uh, their ambition and we haven't. So we have to get moving in the other sectors, in transportation, uh, in stationary energy, we have to get moving in those sectors and that's going to take uh, coordination between the states and the federal government um, and we need to find a way to get the federal government uh, to take these matters seriously and start us on this journey. We know how to do it, we've got uh, drawers and shelves full of plans, um, we just need to have the political will to get on to do it and that probably means uh, changing the composition who, who sits in our parliament.